Welcome to the Source Material Comics Podcast. It's part three of four. We're on episode three right now, and we're going to be talking Alias. That's right. Brian Michael Bendis' run of Alias from Marvel Max. The Marvel Max imprint. We should have called it Marvel Fuck. What should we call this? How about we call it Fuck? Maybe calm down. Put it on, put it on the shelves at your LCS. <laughs> it's going to be up there in the top rack, just like the Bowie magazines were. So we're getting into this, Mark. Let's go ahead and talk about this, because I think this next story that we're going to talk is one of your favorite out of these. And it's just a one shot. Jessica I, Jones. I read J. Jonah Jameson dialogue without hearing J.K. Simmons. There's I no can't. way. There's- I tried. But all I hear is in him. And it's so funny because J. Jonah Jameson is not talking that fast in the book, but I can't not hear J.K. Simmons' Spider-Man 1 performance. Right, right. You cannot uh, divorce his voice from that dialogue and him yelling, get me Spider-Man. So yeah, this is issue 10. We saved this one because it's going to tie in with this larger narrative that's coming after this. Issue 10 is called The End. Alias Volume 3. Issue 10, The End. Story by Brian Michael Bendis. Art by Michael Gatos. Letters by Richard Starkings, R.S. and Comicraft's Wes Abbott. Synopsis for The End. Credit to MarvelFandom.com. J. Jonah Jameson of the Daily Bugle hires Jessica to discover the true identity of Spider-Man and assigns journalist Ben Urich to Shadow Jones in order to write a series of articles chronicling her investigation. Jessica agrees to take the job and proceeds to follow a series of leads through several area charities, including orphanages, hospitals, and soup kitchens, racking up a steep pile of bills for the newspaper to reimburse. And boy, funny issue. Oh, it is. And this is one of those issues that sticks out. We were talking about how they do some weird stuff with the font. They do some weird stuff with the placement of the comic. They do a lot of that weird stuff here. This was the side column stuff, if I remember correctly. At least they have it as a print column in the middle of the page. Yeah. Which is a little hard to read at times. It's kind of tough to... but. Regardless, if you follow it, the story's pretty damn funny. All it is is one issue of Jessica showing up there, and he wants her to try and get him pictures and find out who Spider-Man is. Imagine if you will. I go to you, Jesse. I go to Source Material Incorporated, and I want to hire you to do... LLC. I get food. I want to hire you to do a podcast for the Rattle and Broadcasting Network. And my sales pitch is, listen, everything you do is terrible. And I don't really like you as a person, but you do podcasts and I need someone who podcasts. So here's a hundred thousand dollars in a bag and an eight ball of Coke, a uh, common payment among the Rattle Incorporated. Come work for me. I, I don't think you would. No, <laughs> no, it's not like Jameson is just like, Hey, I've got a great, yeah. I've got a great opportunity here for you. No, it's more along the lines of like, yeah. Let me try to inspire you to take on this job and realize it's important. <laughs> Everything about you is terrible, and I hate your existence. So you want the job. <laughs> <laughs> you want the job, right? Yeah. Oh, Are you yeah. convinced you yet? The fuck? Yeah, he uh, he brings her in, and he's like, I don't like superheroes. I don't like you, because you're a superhero. And I don't like private eyes. I think private eyes are the scum of the earth. But I need you right now to... Did I mention you're a superhero and I don't like superheroes? Listen, I need you to out a superhero for me. See how Daredevil got outed? That seemed to have sold a lot of papers. We'd like to do the same thing, but with Spider-Man this time. It'll sell twice as many papers. Right. And I and I wish they had just gone inside Jessica's head while that was happening. Yeah, and she's sitting there humoring him at first. Right. She's actually seriously considering it. But then Jameson proceeds to dig his own grave, essentially, by sitting there bad-mouthing everything. And then she also gets a sense of what a shitty person he is. Mm-hmm. I don't know how many times prior to this she's been in the presence of jameson my My dad's like let me tell you about gun control in the most insulting asshole way possible are you on my side now no (laughs) why would i be maybe your shit's correct who knows i stopped listening after the fourth time you called me an asshole it's funny that this takes place in 2000 so we're at issue 10 Mm-hmm. I didn't look to see, but you talked about J.K. Simmons as as Jameson and Spider-Man. This is probably happening 
right before right after the first one gets released the first one i think gets delayed into 2002 but there's this chaotic feel to the dialogue of this story where jameson's trying to talk and then he's yelling at his secretary at the same time which is exactly what's happening in the movie he's yeah. trying to talk and he yelled at the secretary and then here comes robbie and then, and then back to the conversation here and then he gets split that's exactly yeah. what it feels like in this it, book it, it feels like he's just a busy emanic reporter editorial editor what he really is is just has poor impulse control. Right. <laughs> <laughs> maybe some AD and D or AD and D. Hey, advanced Dungeons and Dragons <laughs> may be involved. He has some Dungeons and Dragons going on. <laughs> Please use that at some point on somebody. Next time somebody do you have you have a little bit a little touch of the D and D? <laughs> I, will, I will absolutely be using that with them. Please use uh, that. A little, touch um, of the D&D, yeah? uh, a little touch of the D&D. All right, I understand. Sure, we can't keep track. It's a fun story because basically she's like, I'm not going to out Spider-Man. What are you fucking... Out Spider-Man is an angel who walks with Jesus. I'm right. not out Spider-Man, you ass. Yeah. However, I will take your money. And it's like, she doesn't buy herself a car. She doesn't pay her rent with it. She uses it to freaking buy food for the homeless. And she reads to orphans. And she assists at an AIDS hospital and shit like that. And so the whole time, Jim's like, I'll sue. And you're like, you'll sue her for what? <laughs> <laughs> There's no way you can prove that she's not investigating this. Right. And and the fact that you're going to turn around and say, I think the conversation initially starts that she's at a homeless shelter. I think it might be he's talking to Yurik. And he's like, yeah, she's at a homeless shelter. And she's like, yeah, I've, I've got a lead down here. And she, what was there was an insane amount, like 800 bucks for something. Pudding. <laughs> 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 yes it's eight hundred dollars for pudding what the hell like, um, this is bullshit let it go you have lost in the court of public opinion there's no way to come out of this ahead yeah so yeah i love this story she gets one over on jjj mm-hmm. the reason we're holding this one here is because this sh- sets up there's a little bit of an animosity between the two but Jameson is going to have to actually rely on her in this next story. No wonder she took advantage of him. It's ten times worth of what he does in this next uh, series of comics. Okay. All right. Well, the next series, this next is a seven-parter? Parts one through six. Let's try it again. That's six parts. (laughs) Six parts. Issues 16 through 21. The Underneath. Alias issues 16 through 21. The Underneath. Parts 1 through 6. Story by Brian Michael Bendis. Art by Michael Gatos. Colors by Matt Hollingsworth. Letters by Richard Starkings. R.S. and Comic Crafts Jason Levine. Jessica Jones foils a convenience store robbery before returning home to find a teenage girl in a Spider-Man costume in her bathroom. The girl panics and flees, injuring herself. Scott Lang visits and suggests calling the police, but Jessica refuses. Later, she learns from Clay Quartermain that the girl is Maddie Franklin, the third Spider-Woman. Jessica confronts J. Jonah Jameson, who had taken in Maddie, and begins her investigation. She also contacts Jessica Drew for help, but Drew is unavailable. A visit to Madame Webb provides cryptic clues, but Jessica leaves frustrated and unsettled by Webb's visions. Madame Webb gives Jessica a disturbing vision, showing Jessica and Maddie fighting to the death. Jessica, upset by Webb's intrusion into her past, storms out. That night, Jessica has an unsatisfactory encounter with Scott Lang and refuses to share details about Webb's vision. Jessica continues her investigation, meeting with Matt Murdock, who offers legal advice. Malcolm, the young man desperately wanting to work for Jessica, introduces Jessica to Laney, whose brother Denny is dating Maddie. Laney suspects Denny is involved in dangerous activities. Jessica infiltrates Club 616, witnesses Denny extracting tissue from Maddie for drugs, and is thrown out after a fight. Later, Jessica meets with Ben Urich, who explains that Denny is using Maddie for a street drug called mutant growth hormone. Jessica is determined to rescue Maddie. Back at her office, Jessica is attacked by Jessica Drew, who demands answers about Maddie. After a tense meeting with Jameson, Jessica and Drew track Denny to the Matador Hotel. Jessica and Drew face off against Denny and an unsuspecting speedball who is at the Matador Hotel as well. Jessica is knocked unconscious and experiences a surreal hallucination involving various superheroes. Upon waking, she stops Denny from escaping and, with Drew's help, subdues the attackers. Speedball reveals he was setting up Denny with the NYPD, who then arrive at the scene. 
Jessica escapes with Maddie, evading the police and ensuring her safety. Six weeks later, Maddie and Marla, Jameson's wife, visit Jessica, thanking her for the rescue. Maddie tries to explain her ordeal, but struggles with memory gaps. She gives Jessica a framed newspaper clipping celebrating their heroism. Later, Scott Lang confesses his love for Jessica, admitting he sees her as better and smarter than she believes. Jessica, moved by his words, accepts his invitation for a fancy date, hinting at a new beginning. Yeah, and so Jessica Jones at least has some, she's brought into this because, as you said, the girl's in her apartment and then she eats herself out the window. And Jessica Jones is like uh, trying to figure out who she is and why this happened. And that's when she figures out the connection to J.J. Jones Jameson. She's like, let me go tell him what's going on. And so she gets in the car and J.J. Jones Jameson, and so she goes through the whole story with him. It's like, here's everything that's happened up till now. And he goes, you're holding her hostage. You're holding me up for money or I'm going to ruin your life. And she's like, None of what I just said was that. Thing is, is that he has some bit of, I, I don't know, an excuse to believe because he's that type of person after their first interaction. He's going to think that she's going to take advantage of him no matter what. And that as soon as he's, as soon as she darkens his doorstep again, it's, he wouldn't believe a word that she's going to say. Your family who is just incessantly negative. Everyone's out to get them. Nobody can be trusted. Oh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> the girlfriend just said, mm hmm. Yeah, yep. Jessica Jones Jameson. That's why mm -hmm. like, I'm not in any way sympathetic for him because basically Jessica Jessica Jones got in the car and was like, "I want to help you find your your adoptive daughter." And he went, "You're a terrible human being who shouldn't be here right now, and I want you dead. Bring back my daughter. No one will do anything nice for you." Uh, <laughs> right. <laughs> Cole in your stocking every year for Christmas. Right. Like, it's so bad. I love this series <laughs> for this reason only. Me, I'm such a film person. I'm I shot this episode of the Jessica Jones show in my head. And when they, so the whole thing, and I don't know if you're going to go into a plot synopsis at all, but basically Maddie got caught up with some ne'er-do-wells and she's doing drugs, but because this is a superhero universe, like, the, the drug gives you superpowers. Not, not, only, not only that, they are taking bits of flesh from her, turning that into a drug as well. Okay. They're taking parts of her body and turn it into mutant growth hormone or something right. weird. They're syn synthesizing her powers. But right. Go ahead. So that's where this is all heading. And so finally we get to the part where they find her. They know where she is and they kick down the door. And she's joined by this point by Jessica Drew, who is the emperor. And she's doing force lightning on her in one scene. I'm sorry, it's a spider bite. Wow. It's a hell of a way to start a conversation. To walk in like, hello? Wow. Give me back my friend. I don't have your friend. Stop hurting me. I love when she gets up and she decks the fuck out of her too. <laughs> Jessica Drew gets punched out. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, she got punched into a different comic. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, Jessica Drew and Jessica Jones team up, and they kick down the door, and in there is Speedball. Oh my gosh! Oh, this it's, it's, it's uh, like so of errors at this point is what I'm trying to get at. Give me a second, okay? Because the whole Speedball thing, we know we've got a oh, per Bailey. personal friend of ours, a uh, big fan of Speedball, and that's Chris Bailey. I doubt that Bailey would appreciate <laughs> what Bendis did with Speedball Bailey in this series. <laughs> I started to think after getting to that point, I, I mean, we're warriors. What's that? I was in the new warriors. <laughs> right. Right. You're responsible for the civil war. That's that's right. And civil war. Hasn't it's happened. not happened yet. Not happened yet. We remember we did the redemption of Speedball penance, if I remember correctly. Right. But anyway, I got to this point in this book and we're late into it now. We're in the teens here, high teens yeah. of this book. And I started to realize that Bendis likes to take established B-level people and really fuck with them. Yeah. Rick Jones. It's got a, a very boys feel to it. Oh, yeah. 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 And there's other little stuff that you see how he doesn't. I don't want to call it, I, I will call this, it's irreverent. The way that he treats some of the other, mentions other people, he brings it, he, he likes to take the piss out of them. And Speedball's one of them who's sitting there, he's just this goofy teenager trying to, oh, I'm, I'm working with the police. I totally thought about you. Because he drops a dark hawk reference. Oh yeah, dude, and that's another one where I was sitting there going, like, "Fuck, he Bendis just doesn't care. He he don't care who he pisses off." And of course, this is two thousand one, and at the time, I think it was probably passe to be like, eh, "Remember that about five years ago? Yeah, the nineties, man, piss on them." And I think that's what Bendis was going with. Yeah. I thought it was funny. I didn't hate him for it, but oh, I just yeah, thought I he, he was just. He just I treated him like a joke character. I love the boys. I know this season apparently pissed off a bunch of conservatives. I don't give a fuck. 
Um, I haven't watched it yet. I'm Me either. Dreading, I'm dreading our review because certain somebody's been. Oh, oh goodness! It is what it is. I don't care anymore. Come one, come all. <laughs> come all um, over me. <laughs> I can't. I can't just talk to my friends about a thing I like anymore. It has to be a fucking orgy every single time. Oh, oh um, goodness! Yeah. Once again, I'm in an orgy I didn't ask for. <laughs> Once again, I'm in an orgy. <laughs> um. Anyway, I love that they just kicked down the door and there's speedball and everyone's kind of like, "What the fuck?" And then his like powers go haywire and his balls everywhere. And they're just like, "What are you doing?" He's like, "I sometimes don't have control over my powers." <laughs> <laughs> it's fucking it's pretty funny it's pretty yeah, the funny whole, the whole conclusion to that series was fucking hilarious to me but yeah they get maddie back to the jameson's if i remember correctly and uh, all's well that ends well i think they end up either killing or subduing the main bad guy in this who was just a drug dealer yeah it wasn't like we were dealing with a, some big bad or anything really the main big bad here i think is i don't know human trafficking they grabbed this girl yeah and they using her. They, you know, she's utterly dehumanized. Yeah, and just com- they keep feeding her drugs over and over to where right. she just has no idea what's going on. So there's a message here about the CD underground. Well, it's called the underneath. So yeah. it's kind of a gritty street tale that shows that heroes can get mixed up in some shady stuff. So that is also another thing that thing that they were just kind of using to be, hey, this is yeah, she's a superhero, but she's also a teenager, so she's kind of vulnerable to these types of things she just got mixed in with the wrong crowd and then started that crowd started taking advantage of her i I think there might have been some more stuff between scott i think that development their relationship developed a little bit through these shoes she goes to his apartment a couple times she's weirded out by the whole maddie thing so she's going to his apartment and then i think so she can there's a really great moment a really great relationship human moment in this where she confides in him and he was just like oh is that because you were raped and she's like why would you assume that at the end of this, six weeks later, I'll read this. This is the conclusion. Six weeks later, Maddie and Marla visit Jessica, thanking her for the rescue. Maddie tries to explain her ordeal, but struggles with memory gaps. That What you start to realize is that some of these investigations that she's on kind of go back and relate to Jessica herself and the trauma that she had and some of the stuff that she's going through. Well, that's all of volume three. Anything else you want to say there before we nope, head I'm on good. out of here? Nope, Let's I'm get into good. plugs. Get into plugs. All right. I'm at Mark Radulich, M A R K R A D U L I C H on TikTok, Mark Pine 76 on Instagram. Instagram. Yvonne. 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 Network is the landing page. WTM Network is on uh, YouTube. And then I'm on Apple Podcasts and Spotify, wherever else you download your, your podcast. It's Radulich in Broadcasting. That's where all, you'll find all my movie and TV reviews. All I'm right. Here. He's done talking now. Go check out at Source Matt Cast on Twitter. We post most of everything there, and I'll have some plugs for the other stuff at the end. That over there is Mark Radlich. I'm Jesse Starcher. This has been the third of all four volumes of Alias. Tune in a couple weeks when we discuss the secret origin of Jessica Jones. Thanks for joining us. All of this would not be possible without W2Mnet.com, so make sure to seek them out for more podcasts. If you enjoyed what you heard today, please feel free to share, and we look forward to entertaining you again soon. Thanks for sticking around for the bonus content here after the episode. I got into this story called The Underneath, and I did not know anything about Maddie Franklin, the third Spider Woman. So here's a little history of Maddie Franklin. First appeared in Spectacular Spider-Man number 262 from August of 1998. And her death apparently occurred in Silk, volume 2, number 17 from February of 2017. So here you go, the history of Maddie Franklin. Martha Maddie Franklin, a typical teenager from New York City, found her life forever changed after overhearing a conversation between her father, Jerry Franklin, and Norman Osborne about a mystical ceremony. Maddie took her father's place in the Gathering of Five, a ritual involving five arcane relics. Participants in this ritual receive either a blessing or a curse, power, knowledge, immortality, insanity, or death. The true nature of these gifts is often deceptive, with madness masquerading as power and death resembling immortality. Norman Osborne received insanity, Morris Maxwell received knowledge, Cassandra Webb received immortality, and Gregory Hurd received death. After participating in the mystical gathering of five ceremony, Maddie Franklin received the gift of power, granting her an array of superhuman abilities. 
Her strength was on par with Spider-Man's, allowing her to lift approximately 10 tons. Maddie could move at incredible speeds, easily catching up with accelerating cars, and her superhuman stamina enabled her to exert herself for extended periods without fatigue. Her durability made her resilient to significant impacts, such as falls from great heights or blows from superhuman opponents, and she may have even become bulletproof after absorbing the powers of other spider women. Maddie's agility and reflexes were extraordinarily enhanced, surpassing the capabilities of the finest human athletes. She was extremely limber, with twice the elasticity in her tendons and connective tissues compared to an average human. This made her an exceptional acrobat, capable of performing complex gymnastic maneuvers and easily exceeding Olympic-level performances. Her reflexes were about 40 times faster than those of an ordinary human, allowing her to react with incredible speed and precision. Additionally, she possessed the power of flight, enabling her to propel herself through the air at an unknown maximum speed. After reabsorbing her powers from Charlotte Witter, Maddie's abilities further increased. Her strength may have reached the capacity to lift around 25 tons. She gained the ability to adhere to surfaces via electrostatic attraction, allowing her to climb walls and carry significant weight while doing so. She could also channel and discharge bioelectricity through her hands in the form of venom blasts, which could stun or even kill depending on their intensity. Furthermore, Maddie possessed four psionic spider legs, inherited from Charlotte Witter, which she could extend or retract at will. These legs could emit bursts of energy, adding another layer to her formidable arsenal. When Spider-Man mysteriously vanished from the superhero scene for several months, Maddie adopted his mantle, fighting crime in his name. Her efforts eventually caught the attention of Jessica Drew, the original Spider-Woman, who gave Maddie her blessing to use the Spider-Woman moniker. Maddie experimented with various costumes before settling on a black and red bodysuit. Her admiration for Spider-Man grew into an intense crush, culminating in an awkward moment where she kissed him while he was performing CPR on her. However, Peter Parker, still grieving over the apparent death of Mary Jane, rejected her advances due to their age difference and his unresolved feelings. Eventually, Maddie was adopted by her uncle, Jay, Jonah Jameson, who provided her with a more stable home environment. Maddie's life took a darker turn when she disappeared from the superhero community. She broke into Jessica Jones's apartment in a drug stupor, but quickly fled. Jessica Jones discovered Maddie was being kept sedated by her boyfriend, who was harvesting her genetic material to create mutant growth hormone, a power-inducing drug. With the help of Jessica Drew, Jones rescued Maddie and returned her to the safety of her adoptive father, J. Jonah Jameson. After the Civil War, she was considered for recruitment into the initiative and later joined the superhero support group, the Loners, in Los Angeles. Her time with the Loners was fraught with conflict, culminating in a disillusionment with her fellow heroes and deep regret over compromising her principles. She got involved in breaking up an MGH ring, which led to conflicts within the group, and she ultimately left the support group. During the Grim Hunt, Maddie was captured by the Kravinoff family and ultimately sacrificed in a ritual to revive Vladimir Kravinoff. Her sacrifice succeeded, but Vladimir returned as a monstrous, lion-like creature. Maddie's death was a test run for the Kravinoff's ultimate goal, the resurrection of Kraven the Hunter. Over a year later, Maddie was brought back to life as a clone by the Jackal. She initially supported the New You Initiative, but later turned against it after learning more about its true nature. In a final act of heroism, Maddie sacrificed herself to protect Silk and her uncle from attacking carrion zombies, crumbling to dust in Silk's arms. Despite her tragic end, Maddie's legacy as a hero remained, leaving a lasting impact on those she fought alongside and protected.